Welcome to the DK Podcast. This is the dream child of uh, executive producer Akil Rafiq, along with the help of and the assistance of yours truly. And in this series, we're going to try to highlight social issues, particularly related to history, society, and in our cases at the moment, sport. My name is Carl Greenwich. I'm a former professional cricketer. I'm now head of cricket in an independent school in London. And in our first instalment, I'm very, very pleased to introduce two very, very influential cricketers um, from two different generations. Uh, firstly, uh, my very good friend, um, Little Bro, even though I look up to him in many ways for what he's achieved and what he actually stands for, ex-England um, international Michael Carberry. And I'm also very proud to introduce my father, ex-West Indian legend and cricketer, Sir Gordon Greenwich, to my right. Uh, good afternoon, gents. Thank you for um, coming along and thank you for agreeing to do the podcast uh, with us. Um, first of all, I want to talk about, it's been a very, very obviously weird summer in, in many aspects, um, but obviously we're going to dive straight into uh, the cricket. And I want to talk just a little bit about West Indies um, coming over early this summer. Uh, first of all, um, just uh, to Sir Gordon. It's been weird calling him Sir Gordon. Uh, Sir Gordon, uh, I just want to talk about how you thought West Indies performed in general, really, seen as though there was probably very little expectation. Um, and obviously quite a short series, being only three test matches. Um, I'd just like to know your thoughts on, on, on how, uh, how they performed and how the series actually ended up. Oh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, but can I just actually sort of, uh, you can just call me Gordon. Okay, <laughs> Gordon, Gordon will do for, <laughs> the, be fine. for this afternoon. <laughs> then. That'll be fine. Okay, no At problem. least for now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yes, um, when I heard that the tour was going ahead and the West Indies was traveling to play England, I just thought, well, what is to be expected from this tour? And uh, having it be just three test matches and just this perhaps is part of the course these days because I cannot see any country sort of playing West Indies in a five test series. So I think that's what we can expect from now on for, for quite some time to come. But first of all, the players, were they up to it? Were they ready for it? Were they um, perhaps briefed enough as to what, what, what was going to happen and how they're going to actually sort of work within the parameters of this uh, Pandemic. Um, I was. I wasn't quite sure, but obviously the authorities felt it was fine to have the tour take place. And yeah, I, I believe all measures been or anything that would actually sort of help the tour run smoothly was put in place in order to uh, to accommodate the West Indies team. But uh, the thing is, is this the playing cricket on the side is one thing, or in the, in the dressing room and molding your squad and getting them prepared for the tour and then the actual cricket side. So I would I would more focus more on the cricket side now because that is that is something that's been a, a major bother for quite some time with the West Indies team. They never seem to be ready or prepared for the tours that they have gone on in recent times where they, they, they've been wanting lack fun find wanting for the game and refining their game and obviously they, 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 they the line up that they want to play and how you are going to actually sort of mix and match those players for the positions that they are pe perhaps better suited for. And um, I, I am not really well up with West Indies cricket these days. I've been uh, away from the game for quite some time. I hardly watch the game. Uh, I, I don't watch the T20 game. I would prefer the test match and so on, but they don't get a great deal of that. And what I've seen in recent times don't leave a lot of lot to be desired at all. It's been lacking in consistency. It's been lacking in professionalism. It's been, been lacking in the thinking ability of players playing the game. And we're not going to go into speak of what they receive from playing the game. That's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. Things have changed from when I played. But I think players should focus 
in developing their game and developing the game in such a way that it will assist them to play in any format of the game. Don't tell me you are just a one-day player and you now get a chance to play a test match and you, you, you're going to play because you're going you're gonna to earn finances. So I say players should try to play in the longer version game as much as they possibly can. Because to me, that would help them to develop the skills of this game to be able to play in any format. Just thinking that you're just a one-day player, I don't think that's enough. It may bring you finance, fine, but representation of anyone's country is the longer version of the game, how they're able to promote the game and be able to assist their team to be successful in the longer version game, meaning the test match. I think that's why it's called a test match, I believe, because it tests all, it tests all of our skills, our skills. And if you are not able to do that, I mean, if you, if you fall down in the skills that you need to promote yourself in the longer version game, I just feel that the one day game is short lived to you. Yes, you're going to earn, but you will only play and be successful or very occasionally, even in the short, shorter version game. So, I would have preferred to guys just focus more on playing the longer version game and develop the skills. But the tour itself to England this year was was disappointing to say the least, which has been that way for quite some time now, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and not drawing any punches here because anyone telling me that if they're satisfied with what went on, perhaps don't feel anywhere close to you know a real cricket. Uh, person or understanding this game because um, I, I know that most of the time when you play and tour the one thing you want to do is to perform and be able to contribute to the team to the success of the team and if you don't win at least you need to make it hard for your opposition don't give up and too much of that happened and it's been happening for too, too long and I think the players really need to take stock of what's been happening in their own personal game and also their own contribution to the team, which I dare say sometimes doesn't really show me that they are focusing too much on that, and they would just like to maybe get the innings over with and so on, because that's how it appears to be. You watch the game, you watch players play, and batting don't seem to be enjoyed these days. You're not going to get a lot of chances sometimes. So whenever you do get the opportunity, you need to make it count. You need to stay up there, spend time in the wicket, so you can develop the skills of the game. The longer you stay there, the better it's going to be for you. And don't be afraid of what's happening as well, because you're going to get bowlers who's going to get your number or have your number up more often than others. But that is the competition. That is a challenge that you sign up for. And you need to be able to work with that and be able to cope with it. But to be quite honest, um, I was quite disappointed in uh, the, the, the tour that, that happened over here. I mean, just even look at the World Cup prior to that. I mean, that was really a, a no-showing as far as I'm concerned. One or two uh, noticeable performances and so on, but not enough of it. And the players who you expected to actually sort of put up a good showing in, in, in the game, didn't really come come to the to the plate at all. They did not step up. So there is a lot to be half of West Indies cricket. There's a lot to do, and I would hope that the coaches or those who are involved with developing West Indies cricket back in the Caribbean pay more attention to the developing skills of these players because they are too one-dimensional and they're not able to actually to come to terms with the skills of the game that is needed for them to last and their careers to go on for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now looking at this one personally, from a personal perspective, I think, you know, many people might think winning one test match is progress, but, you know, winning one and not turning up in another two, for me, is pretty much indicative of the way West Indies cricket has gone in recent times. So, yeah, in the actual fact, is there really, was there really any future progress? Um, you know, I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, interesting. Uh, Michael, what are your thoughts on this summer with the uh, West Indies tour in particular? Uh, I mean, I, I can't really share the same sentiment as G, but I mean, obviously from, from my aspect, I was 
lucky enough to watch some of my G's play in that great era. And since that time, I've always been of the belief that what it, it really this series has highlighted yet again the lack of forward planning from West Indies cricket. You know, what is what is their plan going forward? You know, we, we, they've, they've tried so many coaches, in foreign coaches, um, they've got so many people in backroom staff, so they've spent money, you know, all in the all in the wrong areas. And, and for me, I look at this, the, this, the players now that are coming through. And I think to some degree, it is a bit of a global problem. I don't think it's just West Indies experiencing this. I think it is a bit of a global problem where short form cricket now is the thing players definitely want to delve into because, as I say, they, their status as players can go up so much quicker, they can earn money so much quicker. And I'm of the belief, and when I, mean, I coach kids now, you know, I, I'm a real stickler for learning to play the longer form of the game. Because for me, God oh geez, you know, if you can if you can master the longer form of the game, undoubtedly the short form of the game becomes a lot easier. Um, what what I'm seeing now as a general, um, there's a couple there's a couple of things with West Indies cricket, but the, what, what I'm definitely seeing as a general is I don't see that real spirit playing for the maroon badge uh, like I used to. You know, guys who played for a purpose back in the day. You know, that's those are the guys who inspire people like myself, yourself. Um, I don't see that with this current crop of West Indies players. I see, you know, a little bit of pop, too much party boy, sort of, you know, people wanting to be, sort of want to be rap artists and, 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 and musicians, and then they play a little bit of cricket for the West Indies on the side. That's what, that's what I'm seeing. Um, you know, I think back to that great era, you know, guys were fit, strong, you know, were, were ahead of their time in terms of, in, in, in a lot of facets of the game. I look at some of the guys coming back from lockdown. Now, remember, you've had 10 weeks of sitting there, you know, to get yourself in the best physical condition you can. And that, a lot, you, yeah, you can rely on coaches to do that. You can rely on strength conditioning coaches to do that. But I think a lot of that has to come from the individuals themselves. I won't name names, but I think we all know what I'm talking about. That is a, that is a very poor indictment of West Indies cricket me you know I, i've seen people laughing you know i remember he you know the indians toured the west indies recently and this fella turned out and people they were actually physically laughing because they didn't think they were taking this guy seriously as a west indies cricketer and i think back to that great year i said gordon desi richie viv logie dijon you know all these all the fast bowlers were fit strong were able to bowl long spells and keep their pace great athletes roger harper you know, great athletes could cover ground, best fielders. I'm not seeing that in that. I'm not seeing that. I, I could come out of retirement now. I thought to myself, I could actually come out of retirement now. I mean, not play the game in a year and a half. And and I'm in better shape than guys who are supposed to be current international sports people. Now, that shouldn't happen. And that, you know, and, yeah, look, I'm not drawing punches either. I think a massive finger has to be pointed. Firstly, at the players, and then at the establishment. What, what, what is the planning? What is the plan for this team? You've got someone like Jason Holder, who I think, look, he's a, he's, a, he's a nice kid, he's a nice guy. He's building himself as a, you know, a, a, a decent all-round cricketer in terms of the world rankings. But then you look at the rest of his team and you think, right, who, who is pulling that team with him? You know, I just don't, I just don't see, I've seen a lot of flash in the pans. You know, I've seen a lot of, you know, I saw one lad on 95 with seven runs to win in a test match and spoon it to, to, to mid off. And I think, what are you doing? That's one, that's an opportunity to get a test hundred, something I never achieved. You don't throw those away, your dad will tell you that. And second of all, that's an opportunity to win the game. You've done the hard work, you, you, you've broken the back of the round chase, win the game. And those, those, it's a, it's a cultural thing, you know. Is that, you know, if I walked in a West Indies dressing room now, would I feel that that's a, a real collective will and a culture in the dressing room? I don't think I would. And I think it's if it goes well and all the moons align, you kind of feel, yeah, you know, they 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 got someone will come good, a Shea Hope or a, or a Blackwood or something like that will come good. But I don't feel that day to day consistency. We're still talking that word about West Indies cricket consistency. Well, it's got to start. So when does that consistency stop? And that's a real disappointment for me. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I echo, you know, all, all these sentiments really, and, and probably from the first two answers, it's it's pretty evident that these uh, these sort of answers are coming from a very very passionate place. Um, you know, with all three people sitting at the table, I think one positive I personally I could think I could draw is that the very same name that you mentioned is uh, you know, Jason Holder. I think he's a, a very respectable young cricketer. Um, I think he's the right man to lead the team. But yeah, we've got to build, um, you know, got to build a lot of um, a, the right parts and have the right parts around him and support him in in, in his journey and and the progress to taking West Indies cricket back to something like um, how it how it was and how we would all like it like to see it be. Um, just on that, actually, we touched on it a little bit. Um, uh, Gordon, what what do you think? What is your view? Um, in a let's say a, a slightly shortened uh, version uh, on the current state of, of West Indies cricket, because obviously Jason Jason Hold has um, inherited a team and um, a setup that is you know pr pretty low, pretty short on confidence, um, and by international standards, um, there will be question marks against um, the, 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 maybe the quality of the players coming through. Um, you know, what, what do you think about their current state? Um, and if you want to you know, talk a little bit on you know potentially how how West Indies got to where it was, what's your thoughts? Or where it is, sorry. Well, where it is, where... <clears throat> well, it's very difficult to, to put your finger on the exact reason why West Indies cricket is the way it is at the moment. Uh, there is a lack of, of, I would say, development within the Caribbean as far as cricket is concerned. Definitely the standard of cricket in the Caribbean is low and that is where we have to choose our players from. The players don't have those opportunities to travel anymore, in particular playing in England. So it means that all their cricket really is developed in the, Carib in the Caribbean. Now to say that, if, you, if two teams play in the Caribbean and um, one team getting if they're lucky, 300 runs. But they are winning the game by innings and quite a lot of runs. I mean, and the, the, I must say the pitch in the Caribbean are not as uh, assistant to the faster bowlers like they were in years gone by. Um, and I suppose that's why with the spinners that they have, many of them play and do well within the Caribbean. And hence, when the West Indies players play overseas, you find that oppositions make sure that they have two or three spinners in their team because they realize that most of the players do not or cannot play spin well. So they were more likely to have a couple of quick bowlers or uh, two quick bowlers and a medium pace or a couple of medium paces and three spinners. That is, that is more than enough. But... The thing with that is the development side of cricket in the Caribbean is nil. They chop and change as to who's going to be leading or be in charge of the various teams and so on. Uh, you quite mentioned Jason Holder. I think he, he did a good job. And I think also Darren Sammy did a good job when he was captain as well too. Uh, for whatever reason, um, he fell out of, of grace with, with, with the establishment. But then... And look back now on what's happened recently. We have players like the Bravo and the Polars and, and all those guys. And those guys didn't want to play for West Indies. But now we find that they're making uh, like Pollard captain of the white ball cricket. Now, like, if we're going backwards, I am not condemning these players and so on. It's not their fault. But the authorities don't seem to be moving forward to develop West Indies cricket. We're going backwards. I'm not saying that I have a name to put up there for them as to who should be captain the team. But what I'm saying, we take two steps forward and half a dozen back. There's, there's no continuity, there's no progress. So we've got to find a way. Not only that, all the coaches we've had taking charge of West, various West Indies teams have been overseas coaches. Are you trying to tell me there's no one in the Caribbean equipped to do these jobs. So obviously we're really dark cricketers when we used to play. Obviously because you don't feel so, the authorities. But yet they, they talk about this, 
But then all of a sudden you hear this name cropping up, a guy who uh, from some place or another come up to, to coach West Indies cricket. And to be quite honest, some of those players were not prominent players in their own country, but yet they can coach the West Indies. <laughs> now I'm afraid of this, honestly. So this is my honest views. This is an observation. If you wish to call it a criticism, so be it. But I'm observing this, and I'm thinking, but well, obviously I was no good. Or maybe the defense but Hayne was no good. Or maybe uh, Sir Bill Richards was no good. We were just average players. And we don't have any coaching skills. But I also have to say this, even with that, I do believe that some of the players, when you go to approach them, do not give you the same response or do not look like they relate to you that you can do the job. They will much rather have a foreign person looking after them. Now, you tell me, how does that person understand the West Indian culture? You tell me that. I mean, what am I doing that is so wrong if I come and speak with you? I mean, you, you wish me to pat on your, you pat you on the back or hug you and embrace you and so on? No, it is pandemic world, of course. <laughs> but no chance. You've got a job to do. And all I'm asking you to do is to focus on developing your game so that you can produce. I'm not saying you have to do it all the time, but nobody does. We have peaks and troughs. We go up, we come down. We have good moments, we have bad moments. That's going to happen in all walks of life. So what you have to do is to focus on the game. West Indies cricket is paramount. This is where you were first given your opportunity. So don't tell me you might be prefer to play in the Big Bash or IPL or whatever and don't play for West Indies cricket. Other countries get the opportunity to play in all these other uh, countries in different formats of the game. But I believe that a lot of them still have their own country's cricket at heart. They will go, they will fulfill their contract, regardless of how long they actually sign up for, but then they will go back and represent their country. But I'm not saying that they want to stop you from earning. I don't think that that's something that anyone wants to do. But you were first recognized because you played cricket or cricket for the West Indies. So you owe the West Indies something, whatever it is, no matter how little you may think it may be, but you owe the rest of the West Indies something because you were first recognized because you represented the Caribbean. And I feel you should pay a little more attention to that. Um, I would want to see that the territories lift the standard of the games in order to produce the cricketers that's going to represent the West Indies. How that's going to happen, I don't know. I have my own personal ideas, but I would like the West Indies cricket to form a forum to discuss how, to, how they're going to move forward with cricket and also develop, help to develop the skills of the players coming through. I don't like to see a West Indies team travel and play and be beaten the way they have been beaten in recent times. It looks as if we've now started. We don't look like a, a test team. We don't look as if we can oppose any any competition to our opposition. And I believe they've got to be smiling each time they play the West Indies because someone who's come in for the first time makes this devil and he scores 100, he takes wickets, he performs well, he performs as if he's been there for years. But we don't find that with the present crop of players. And as you said, if you score runs in one match or win one match, that's not the series over. You need consistency. Runs is not always um, gettable for everyone, but I feel that the longer you stay and develop the skills of the game, which means you have to stay at the wicket. So the 30s and the 40s and even the 50s is not sufficient. You want to go on and score bigger runs. You mentioned the players scoring 90, um, Sakabri, but you know, I didn't, I didn't get it out. That can happen, but the manner in which they got out mm. tells me that that is a lack of maturity okay. and understanding of the game. 
that is not good. And any, I mean, a coach can teach you, can look at the game, look at your game, and try to iron out some of the kinks in your game. But invariably, it's for you to take this on board and make sure that you remember and put all of these things into practice in your own game. Whenever you get out there, no matter how good the coach might have been or bad, is for you to learn and to put these things into practice when you get on the field of play. No one could be up there with you other than your partner. Dis discussions with that partner helps as well, but that is also providing that partner is understanding and know about cricket itself because in recent times, you find that two new players almost is at the crease together. Now, who is going to lead one, the other? Which one uh, you'll be looking towards to help to guide this, this player? Both of you are on the same path because none of you really is, is mature enough to assist the other. So that is something that you need to look at. Past players in the past did not get a chance to play with some of the younger players, so they were left to their own devices. Now you've got young players, young players, new players, new players at the wicket together. Now that is a major problem. Look at other teams and how their team are made up, and you can find that some experienced player is with them, or either mentoring them, or playing with them to help guide them. And that is what you need to do. But for some unknown reason, past West Indies players don't seem to be capable enough. Well, I believe that's obvious that is what the authorities are telling you. But um, I, I, I find it doubtful that persons within the establishment can feel that past players don't have anything to contribute to what is happening with West Indies cricket these days. And I believe it, it, there's a lot that needs to be done before we can get back even on even keel, let alone go out there and beat teams that are well established in this game of cricket. Yeah, it, it seems common sense that it's part of um, you know, developing younger players to actually have a mix of you know experience and youth. It, it, it's just uh, common sense, isn't it? But what personally really troubles me is that when you look at the um, uh, successful um, international teams, if you like, you know, you know, let's 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 just you know, uh, you know, call it what it is. How many non-English head coaches have coached England? How many non-Australian coaches have coached Australia? How many non-Indian coaches have? Co Do you know what I mean? It, it, it just it just begs belief that was it just it, it just seemed to always go down that route, but. You know, hopefully, you know, we, uh, you know, we can keep talking, we keep changing, we keep, you know, upskilling, um, you know, our coaches and giving them chances, and you know, we can only really um, hope for the best. Um, we're going to, you know, just dive straight into the, the main topics at hand. Um, one of the one of the points I'd like to make there before I start, before we actually move on from the coaching side of it, even if you have an overseas coach, all the times the West Indies have employed overseas coaches. There never really has been a West Indian working with these coaches. Now, if this coach has so much understanding and experience, you should have local people working with him so that when he leaves, this knowledge that he goes away with, um, goes away with, or had when he came, with, with that new player or new that, co that coach now, so he can continue. I said, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have anyone else from other countries. But don't tell me that you're not going to have a local person working with him to, to assist him to carry on the work that he, he has done. So that is something that we need to look at. Well, I, I, I mean, this is jumping quickly. I mean, as, a, as an Englishman, you know, I've always been a, a massive, I mean, West Indies inspired me to get into cricket. And it pains me even watching the recent CPL. I mean, that, that is a real opportunity missed. And I've said it time and time again, the, 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 the time the CPL has been running for the year it's been running, I've always seen that as a massive opportunity for West Indies to develop their own coaches. Why am I seeing, you know, Andy Flower managing a West Indian territory? Why am I seeing Tom Moody managing a West Indian franchise? That is an opportunity for, 
for local the local coaches, the West Indian carry coaches to get involved and be the head boy of the team. Right? I think that's 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 first mistake. You can look at I look you know, I agree with G's. I, I look at the, the pitches having gone over there for pre season and from various times in Hampshire and the pitches are are people you know, I know I'm being polite here, substandard. Right? Um I mean, look, in, having played a lot of my cricket in England, and England have had their infrastructure problems over time, over years, but it just shows that having some infrastructure is better than none at all. And you just when you when you travel to the Caribbean, yeah, there's no doubt the talent. There is raw talent there. There are guys there who can bowl fast, and guys there who can who can bat. But what I'm see what I've seen over my over my journey as a cricketer going going to and from the Caribbean is a lack of the real fundamentals. You know, I've even offered my services at times, you know, when I certainly when I finished international cricket, to go back to Barbados, which I also have roots in there, and to help and work with the young batters. Shay Shay Hope was one of those, his brother was one of those coming through the system. Because, you know, giving them my experience of playing the moving ball in England my whole life, you know, it will set them up. Because I I will probably have thoughts and ideas on how to do that and take them back to the Caribbean, which may may or may not help the players there. It's just a different voice and a different angle, but also something is coming from someone who's also relatable to them. Mm-hmm. And I was just shut down every time. Mm-hmm. So I, I, can't, I can't sit there with, with, with Gordon in the fact that, you know, I, I think it's incredibly sad that you've got, you know, a team that was dubbed the best ever sporting team in history. And these guys are still around and you are not using their knowledge, their experience. I mean, even even for someone like myself, who wasn't, you know, I didn't have a, a, a long test career, even to have the opportunity to sit down with that in the, in the past and talk batting. And I'm, a, I'm an English county player. That was amazing for me. And I cannot believe that sitting back here, looking from afar, that he's someone like himself, Sabirian Richards, Desi Haynes, you know, not involved working even, even, even if it was about the, the short form of the game. I mean, can you imagine Sir Vivian Richards playing T20 cricket? No. In this <laughs> yeah. part. Kids. Do you know what I mean? And, and to have this guy not involved at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think it's incredibly... I, I think West Indies... It, you know, I, I think the view of West Indies cricket now is almost... It's seen as almost a bit of a stepping stone for developing coaches. So... If you're a, a player who's just come out of the game, you've done your level four, you're looking for an opportunity, you know, you've maybe done a little stint at uh, Gloucester or Hampshire or Surrey or wherever, and you think, right, the next step up now is I want to get on board with international stuff. I think the view is now that, well, if I can get on board with the West Indies, it's almost a, a, a nice, it gets your name out there in terms of the, the international pool of coaches. It's not viewed as a, as it as it once was, it was you just wouldn't get it because you wouldn't get a gig, um, and that's for me something that the West Indies board has missed massively. And you're just looking at the names that have coached the West Indies over, let's say, over the last ten years. I mean, even for me as a current cricketer back then, I haven't heard of some of these guys. And as you know, I was the biggest cricket tragic you knew. <laughs> so how how these guys are. Coaching a national team is beyond me. And yeah, I think it's amazing. I mean, you you mentioned about uh, people like Sabir Richards and so on, and, and other players have been West Indies. I mean, it is. It was disappointing to hear a comment. Then uh, he plays still playing West Indies. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't play that much in recent times. But I don't feel that they feel that the West Indies players. Would, was but that was any good not to say that because the comic was that players that played in the 70s and 80s would not be able to score so many runs if they were playing in today's cricket now that baffled me now, as to what it is they're doing that's so great they can't you can't win a match and if you win one match i mean you, yeah, you, you win you win one out of 15. so your ratio is good that's satisfactory but how, when, how, when, how many series did you lose? Well, 
Well, it's a totally different game, though. Yeah, yeah. but it's it just so unbelievable that that thinking is there that that's how they feel because they, they, they totally sort of disregard what has happened in West Indies cricket. And they don't, they don't have the same sentiments for the game like we had. And representing the West Indies, that was, that was, that wasn't a given right. That was a privilege to represent the West Indies. And then to do well, to perform and to assist in winning matches as well. Well, it was icing on the cake, of course. But, um, you know, when you, when they speak about players that played in that era would not have been able to perform as well as they did uh, then to this, in today's cricket, with, with what has happened in today's cricket. Well, I'm saying most of the rules have been amended, have been amended with, by, for batsmen. Most of them, if you look at them honestly, but it hasn't created better batsmanship. Mm-hmm. They limited the short balls and, you know, and what, what, what's next? Well, what, what, what is a, there's no equality as far as bowling and batting anymore. Before, it was there for both. Now, you've changed up the rules and so on, and it's more favorable towards the batsman because of what has happened. And, but yet, I don't see you scoring that many runs. So, tell me what has happened. Mm. Where's, where's your cricket better than, you know, 25, 30 years ago? Yeah, I mean... I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, the word equality there, which is you know, one of the main sort of topics of our conversation here. Um, and I just want to just slightly turn the focus, just ever so slightly away from West Indies cricket directly. Um, and just just ask uh, Michael Carberry, being a young black man of, of Guyanese and Bayesian descent, growing up in, in, uh, in England, um, South London, obviously around the Surrey system, I just want to just just give us a, an idea of um, you know what that was like um, growing up in the cricketing world um, in in the cricketing community and just short ex- short experience of, of of just your time growing up and just maybe a little little bit about sort of um, what what you felt about your career looking back on it now yeah. looking back on it sorry then knowing what you know now <laughs> oh, it's a long book um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think my first sort of introduction, I mean, my first sort of introduction to cricket really is from my dad, who was a king sort of club cricketer who formed a, a sort of West Indian sort of wandering sort of team. Um, so I guess my early roots into cricket was, you know, watching guys like your dad and Desi and Viv and, you know, it was always cricket, it was always on in the house. I was very lucky that both parents loved, loved cricket. My mum used to go to test matches in Barbados and, What's it like to see more nurse and Basil Butcher and you know these guys, Sir Garfield? Um, so I guess I was very lucky when I got into, I suppose, real organised cricket. The first thing that struck me when looking around was I was always the only one, um, and the sort of reaction of other people towards me. It was almost the only, the only thing I could play. Um, you you were always kind of batting at eight nine. Um, didn't get a bowl and you were just sort of grazing in the outfield a lot of the time but you should, be, you should be a bowl right <laughs> I, I try, I don't worry I tried my best so, 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 I just didn't grow um, but yeah and then funny enough when we go and travel and play teams like Lancashire or Yorkshire at, at sort of under 12 level and things like that where for some reason, they always had a production line of, of fast bowlers up in the north. You know, even at even at that young age, suddenly you find yourself thrust up the order. Yeah, you know, you can face, you can you can open the batting, and that's really, I suppose, where opening the batting started for me. But luckily for me, I was always exposed to it from my from my dad. He was he was a, I say he always exposed me to, to pace and things like that. So I was always comfortable with that side of things. But you know how how you how I move through the the sort of system. And again, I credit my parents. Um, you know, and some parents may disagree with what they said to me, even at those times. But you had you had to be three times better than the average person, and that's just to get an equal shot at what everybody else is doing. So that built a kind of determination, a kind of steel in the way that I played the game. It was that very hard nosed way of playing, give no quarter, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, I suppose my first 
sort of introduction to, I suppose, if you like, racism or prejudice was I was kept out of or shunned really playing for England school was at under 15 level. And I was kind of, I think I was one of the best batsmen across the national averages, right? Oh, it was myself, Daylight, and then the rest. And I was the last name on the team sheet to be picked for the squad. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in three weeks, I played one game, which was a total, we'd already made it through to the next round of the, the semi-finals, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I was played, I played a game against Canada. So it was nothing really to gain. And their reasoning at the end of it, um, and this is a fellow who is now teaching coaches, can you believe it's still in the cricket system, was that oh, I mix with the opposition, in particularly the West Indies guys too much, because the teams generally stayed in the hotels together. Now, at 15, I didn't, I didn't really know how to sort of really process that idea. Really. So I was a bit like, wow, I mean, it, you know, that's, I mean, that's, you know, it's not like I've done anything wrong. You know, it's not like I went to a nightclub or, you know, it was caught with smoking or anything like that. It was, it was, you know, building friendships, you know, and, and building, you know, almost friendship for life. I mean, these, some of the guys that were there at that tournament have gone on to be some of the world's great players. Michael Clarks and Mitchell Johnsons, Chris Gale, and Sala, you know, people who played the game at a very high level. And that was my first introduction to, well, you know, I, this is this is real now, you know. Like everywhere I go, I, I'm I'm always going to be singled out here, you know. Um, and how did it make me feel? Not great, but again, I think having that strong family support at home was you've got to keep pushing through. Um, I think going going up now into my pro career, I think I look back now and I think right. Watching guys now getting fast tracked in the way that they they are now, it seems like they play one second team game. They're already in the first team, and then they they make one good score on TV. They play green. Would things? I ask the question now: If my if I was blonde hair, blue eyed, would I play more cricket than I played? I think I would have. Um, I certainly would have got a, a longer go at international level if if I still had the same statistics because. When I was dropped, I was getting dropped from guys who had lesser statistics. Um, so I've I've definitely seen across across my involvement that it was it was an industry where I felt I was constantly having to keep proving myself way and above what everybody else had to do, um, which gets tiring and it's hard to sustain. You know because sports is highs and lows. Um, you're not always going to be on top form all the time, especially being a batter um, and a top 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 order batsman as well. You know, sometimes it's not even your fault; it's over in a flash, isn't it? Um, and it is it, meant it's mentally very very draining because, as I said, if there's the one fight of going out there to be very very good at what you do, and that's just the skill, the basic skills of the game: bat, v ball, you against the bowler, but also. The other fight where you walk in a change room and it's having gaining the same respect, civil respect that everybody else would get, mm -hmm. and but it, it obviously what I'm saying is although it was tough, it obviously had some very positive effects on, as I said, the way I played the game because I had to learn very very quickly, and it probably stands after my first county that. Yeah. I had to add more and more steel mentally to my cricket because I was never going to be, although people knew I had talent, when you'd be playing together, you know, people knew I had talent. I was never going to be ever one of those kids that someone was going to push forward. And I think it was at that moment where that pen dropped in my head that the, the, the emergence of what you see today came through as a play. So I think it, it Although it was tough to deal with at times, it was frustrating, it's still frustrating to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I think I tried to use it as fuel for the way I played. You know, I I never backed down, I took on all challenges. You know, people still now are very complimentary in the way that I took on Mitchell Johnson in, in what was seen as one of the fastest spells that this decade ever seen. And for me that was if people knew the story behind it, I had massive health issues behind that as well when I was on 
dangerous medication, but I was believing that that will to succeed. You know, the more is override a lot of stuff that's going on in the, in the peripherals. Um, and it, it, that's why I talk about you know I use those things as fuel to go and go and succeed to go to drive myself more and more and more to really prove myself um, and that's what you find yourself doing um, you know yeah it was, it was it was frustrating that you know you look around the account cricket or even coming up through the youth structure that there wasn't you know another face necessarily all the time that you could always relate to. Um, but I guess it's it's kind of systematic of where we where the game is now. You know, the numbers, the numbers, the, the participation um, of, of BAME players is, is, is this new buzzword. BAME players is dropping off, and it's it's been that way for a long time because I think maybe the, the way the structure is, there isn't there isn't one that that. I don't think the game is doing enough personally to open the arms of the game to certain communities and certain players. Um, I've always felt that. Surrey did it once, and funny enough, they created England player. I've never seen that happen again in, in, in Croydon where I was born and brought up. Um, they will say differently, but I will always go back with the numbers say <laughs> 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 yeah, speak for themselves. Yeah, like, yeah, it's dropped 75%. Um, since 2000, when I pretty much started my first class career, mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it, it, it was a it was a career where look, I'm, I'm obviously very proud of what I what I managed to achieve, considering how hard the struggle was, and it, it was a struggle even right to the very end, even how things ended. Again, highlighting again certain issues in the game that we need to address, and and certain people I believe need to be jettisoned from the game. But having said that, I enjoyed I enjoyed the challenge. You know, picking my skills, being able to meet my heroes, my legends of the game, um, and no matter what, you know, your your name, little boy from you know, little black boy from Croydon, will always be actually in history. And I think that's the one thing now that I look back, being retired a year and a half, and I walk past my caps every day, and I think you know that's all the all the struggle was worth it. Yeah, no, listen, I'm proud of you, man. So, you know, there's, there's absolutely, I mean, there's a lot of people that I know who speak a lot about you that, you know, we're, you know, obviously very much proud of what, you, what you've what achieved and what you, you stand for. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, 